Hello again everyone and welcome back to Learn Linux TV. In today's video what we're going to do is check out the Raspberry Pi 5. I have one right here in the studio and I've had some time to check it out and what I'm going to do is tell you all about the Raspberry Pi 5 especially what's different this time around. And there's quite a bit of improvement with this new model. Yes it's faster, a lot faster, which I will talk about in today's video, but it's not just that. There's some very interesting changes when it comes to the Raspberry Pi 5, so I figured this video was necessary to make sure you guys knew what's required to upgrade to the Raspberry Pi 5 if you already have a Raspberry Pi, or just use it in general. There's some very important things to know in this video, so I recommend that you definitely watch the whole thing, because you might not get the full performance out of your Raspberry Pi 5 if you don't pay attention to a very important detail. But before we get into that, I need to take a moment and mention the sponsor for today's video. And that sponsor is Sendio, the makers of ThinLink. ThinLink is a remote desktop solution that enables you to access a Linux desktop from anywhere. ThinLink can be used in a setup for one or a few users, but it can also support thousands of users in enterprise environments, providing remote access to high demanding OpenGL applications running on a centralized server. ThinLink is easy to set up and the performance is great. In fact, ThinLink includes admin tools for system administrators to make managing this product even easier. Part of what makes ThinLink awesome is that it combines the best open source components out there to provide a pure Linux experience. But it's not just about Linux. Clients are available for Windows and Mac OS as well. So even if you don't use Linux as your daily driver, you can still use a Linux desktop anytime you want. And ThinLink is developed by Sendio in Sweden, one of the oldest Linux-centric companies in the world. And these guys know what they're doing as it's developed by the same team behind Tiger VNC and No VNC. So check out ThinLink. It's my favorite remote desktop solution and if you visit the URL that you see on the screen, then you'll let them know that you heard about them from Learn Linux TV. But not only that, you could test it out for yourself and see why it's awesome. You could set it up on a virtual machine, a cloud instance, or perhaps your own computer. And a full version is available for up to 10 concurrent users for free. So check out ThinLink. And with all of that said, it's time to dive into the Raspberry Pi 5, so let's check it out. Like I mentioned during the intro, the Raspberry Pi 5 has quite a few changes this time around which I'm going to go over shortly, but first, let's talk about what's not different. First, the target audience. The Pi 5 won't see the popular single board computer enter any new markets, at least not directly. The new model will still be used in the same kinds of projects that previous models were used in, the difference this time around is that the new Pi will be better at performing the same tasks either by performing them faster, more efficiently, or both. Other things that remain unchanged when it comes to the Raspberry Pi 5 include the number of USB ports, we have four of those, the speed of the network port is still a gigabit network port, the amount of RAM on the high-end model, which is still 8 gigabytes this time around like it was last time, and also the number of cores. The Raspberry Pi 5 features a quad-core CPU just like the last model. However, when you peel back those basic layers, you'll see that a great deal has changed when it comes to the Pi 5. First of all, since we're already on the subject of the CPU, let's start there. The BCM2712 CPU that powers the Pi 5 was built in-house by Raspberry Pi, and that's impressive to say the least. This means that the Pi 5 literally has a CPU of its own. Now it's still an ARM CPU, so we're not using a different architecture or anything like that, but the CPU this time around was specifically developed for the Pi, which is really cool. And this new chip is no slouch either. It clocks in at 2.4 GHz compared to the previous model's 1.5 GHz. And that's a pretty big improvement, but the awesomeness of the Pi 5 doesn't end there. In addition, the Raspberry Pi 5 has expanded capabilities. The RP1 chip, which is brand new with this model, takes over the majority of I.O. operations. Examples of the work that this new chip handles includes two USB controllers, gigabit ethernet, and even a four-lane PCIe 2.0 endpoint. Now the USB controllers and the gigabit ethernet controller might not seem like a big deal, but the RP1 chip handling all of these operations is taking this work away from the main board. And the four-lane PCIe 2.0 endpoint will definitely have a lot of people talking. It'll open up some very neat possibilities. There's even a hat that's planned for release later this year that will enable you to use NVMe storage. But as of recording time, I don't have access to that in order to test it out. 
It's definitely something to look forward to, so there's that. So there's quite a bit to get excited about this time around, and I'm sure you guys will definitely enjoy the performance boost. But the thing is, there's also different accessories this time around, and we'll start with the big one. In order to get started with the Raspberry Pi 5, you're going to need a new power supply. Kind of. So let's break this down. A 3 amp power supply, such as one that you might have used on a previous model, that will work with the Raspberry Pi 5. The thing is though, it'll only provide just the minimum amount of power that the Pi 5 needs just to function. In fact, with a 3 amp power supply, the new Pi will activate low power mode, which comes with a few penalties, such as USB ports having less power and USB boot being disabled. However, if you use a fully supported 5 amp power supply, then the full potential of the Raspberry Pi 5 will be unlocked. In that case, the USB ports will be provided with an additional 5 watts of power, with the entire Pi having 5 watts more headroom in case it needs it. The new Pi is able to utilize this additional power because it supports something called power delivery, which is yet another improvement with the new model. However, what might be confusing for some of you is that even if you do have a 5 amp power supply and it does support power delivery, you might still be stuck in low power mode. So why is that? The reason for this is due to a race condition between the Pi and the power supply itself. Many chargers out there that do support power delivery, they do so by increasing the voltage when a device is first powered on, rather than delivering the full voltage from the get-go. And this might cause the Pi 5 to detect that a charger is inadequate even when it's fully capable of 5 amps. When this happens, you could simply try rebooting the Pi and low power mode may not trigger the next time since the power supply would have already reached 5 amps by that point. If you're curious how to tell whether or not you're in low power mode, there's a command for that, and here it is. If you simply run vcgencmd along with git underscore config, and then usb underscore max underscore current underscore enable, you'll get the status of whether or not low power mode is enabled. This might be confusing for some of you because normally we don't have to put this much thought into something as simple as a power supply. There just has to be an easier way, and thankfully there is. And the easy solution is to simply use the official Raspberry Pi 5 power supply, like the one that I have here. It's made by Raspberry Pi, and the way that they've designed it, it's always going to provide a continuous 5 amps of power. That way, you can avoid low power mode. In fact, you can avoid thinking about anything that I just mentioned. If you have this power supply, you simply plug it in, use your Pi, and that's it. So the takeaway here is that with the Pi 5, you have to be mindful when it comes to how you power it. If you have a 5 amp USB-C charger with power delivery, and it delivers consistent power, then you could definitely use it. But when in doubt, just buy the official charger, and you're done. In addition, another thing that you should be aware of is that if you have an official Raspberry Pi camera, or maybe an official Raspberry Pi touchscreen display or something like that, you're going to need an adapter if you want to use those accessories on the Pi 5. The reason for this is that there's two dedicated slots for cameras and displays on this board. Each of these can have one camera or one display connected. And it's great to have dedicated connectors for these, but the result is that you'll need new cables or an adapter in order to connect your accessories to the Pi 5. Now to avoid confusion, if you want to use multiple displays with the Raspberry Pi 5, you don't have to use these slots. We still have micro HDMI ports on the board, and that's how most of you are going to connect a display. So for you, nothing really has changed. But if you're building a project, and you want to include a camera or a touchscreen display, then you're going to probably use these connectors, and again, you'll need different cables in order to do so. Now, since we're on the subject of displays, the Raspberry Pi 5 is able to drive two 4K displays at 60 frames per second, and also HDR is supported this time around, which is pretty cool. So if you like to use your Pi as a desktop computer, then the Pi 5 will definitely be a great fit for that. Now, let's talk about cooling. Just like before, the Pi 5 board comes with nothing but the board itself, not even a heatsink. But do you even need a heatsink and fan when it comes to the Pi 5? Technically, no. No, you don't. You can definitely use it without one. But if you plan on doing anything aside from very light tasks, then you should definitely consider buying a cooler. At this point in the Pi's lifespan, you're going to need at least a heatsink if you plan on taking full advantage of your hardware. And if you're not planning on taking full advantage of the Pi 5, then, well, you don't need one. The Pi 4 is probably good enough for you. But if you have a use case for the Pi 5, then you probably have a use case for a cooler or heatsink, and I recommend that you pick one up. They're very inexpensive anyway, so there's no reason not to. While we're on the subject of accessories, let's talk about some official accessories from Raspberry Pi. We have the official case, 
and also the official active cooler. And of course I bought these accessories because I want to tell you guys all about them, so let's take a look. First, let's take a look at the case. The official case for the Pi 5 comes with some heat sinks that you can stick on, and the case itself features a fan. The fan is reasonably quiet, but it's not silent. Honestly, it's not loud enough for me to care about it, but you will hear it if it's up close. But more importantly, it'll help keep your Pi cooler. And that's really neat because you have a case with a fan built in, and it comes with heat sinks as well, so if you buy the case, you have pretty much everything you need to keep your Pi cool. For quite a few of you, it's probably all you need. If you want to step up your cooling game though, you could consider the official Raspberry Pi Active Cooler for your brand new Pi 5. And this is pretty cool. It's one piece of aluminum and has a much larger surface area, so cooling should be more efficient with this cooler. If you want to push your Pi to the next level, then this might be a good fit for you. But how much do these accessories cost? Well, the official case will set you back around 10 US dollars, and the Active Cooler can be purchased for as low as 5 US dollars. If you also buy the official power supply, and I recommend that you do, you'll add an additional $12 to the cost of entry for the Pi 5. While I'm on the subject of having you buy things, we should probably talk about how much the Raspberry Pi 5 itself costs. The 4GB model can be purchased for $60 US dollars, and the 8GB model can be yours for $80 US dollars. It's a little bit more expensive than the previous model, but not by much. Now at this point, I've gone over everything I think you need to know when it comes to getting on board with the new Pi 5 when compared to earlier models. But before I close out this video, there's some additional improvements with the Pi 5 that may not make exciting B-roll, but are still worth mentioning. First, the Pi 5 features a built-in power over ethernet header right there on the board. This means that you'll be able to power your Pi directly from a compatible ethernet switch, if you happen to have one. However, a power over ethernet hat is still required for this to work though, and this accessory has not been released yet. But if you wanted to boot your Pi over the network, well, the board at least features the capability of doing that. All we need is the hat and we'll be good to go. We're supposed to have it sometime this year, but I didn't have it for testing, so I wasn't able to see how that worked. I guess power over ethernet is something to look forward to at least. Other improvements include, but aren't limited to, Bluetooth 5, a physical power button on the Pi board itself, and also Wake on LAN is now supported. Now the thing is with Wake on LAN, the firmware doesn't support this, at least not yet, and I'm not sure if it will, but at least the board itself is capable of this if Raspberry Pi wants to enable this feature. Of course there's other changes with the Pi 5 as well, but the highlights that I gave you in this video are going to be the most important things that you'll need to know. Overall, I'm very impressed with the Pi 5. It's a great board and I recommend that you pick one up, if you have a use case for one. The thing is, for some people, the Pi 5 might be overkill. Maybe the Pi 4 that you already have is working well enough, and if that's the case, you probably don't need a Pi 5, but if you are in the need for more power, the Pi 5 will provide you more power, as long as you provide it more power with the official power supply. What are you working on with your Raspberry Pi? Let me know in the comments down below. I'm excited to find out what you guys are working on. As for me, I'm working on more Linux-related content for you guys, so definitely subscribe to Learn Linux TV for the latest in Linux. I can't wait for you guys to see what's coming on this channel. In the meantime though, thank you so much for watching this video. I really appreciate it.